Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for each and every one that's here. We ask now for your blessings on our service tonight. We pray that you would help us as we seek to, to honor you in, in the singing of hymns and, and praising you for all that you're doing, and also through the, the preaching and, and engaging in the Word of God. I thank you again for, for what you're doing here. I thank you for what you're doing in our hearts. I thank you especially for what you're doing across the world. Mm -hmm. Some people in most difficult places. And Lord, just you bless. You keep them, you guide them. We ask now for your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. 156, open my eyes that I may see. It's like, I don't know, anyway, we'll, we'll leave it there. But uh, 506, all your anxiety. Um. <clears throat> Oh. 
singing it perfect so there you can join me in my imperfection on the second joy is abounding
to mark that one down as new. All right. Sometimes I even scare my There's nothing like picking out a song, getting up here to lead it, and realize you don't know it. <clears throat> it really wakes you up. No doubt. All right, if you have your Bibles, turn into 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. We were, or had, just finished um, uh, verse 3, chapter 3, verse 3, second. 1 Peter, excuse me. And uh, uh, verse 3 says, he says, Whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning of plaiting of hair and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. And I was talking about, I think, um, about, uh, I picked on the ladies. Not that I was picking, the scripture was, was there about dress. And, and I also mentioned that uh, we men have the same problem too. Sometimes we let our dress, I know I have in the past. You know when your button around your belly button doesn't stay buttoned, there's something wrong with your belly button. So you have to understand um, it gotten a little big for me and you don't really pay attention a lot of times but that's not the case with all people some people they dress to attract and, and that's not what you want to do so um, and you don't want to be as cheap as I was neither I guess what I'm trying to say is there is a dress standard okay for the house of God especially but I think there's a dress standard anyway um, I had a, a, a three points and I did not bring them tonight, and I was thinking about them, and just didn't look up and see where I'd put them. But about dress and what they, you know, you have people that come uh, the house of God just like they're dressed, and they don't dress good at home, they don't dress good in church. And, and then you have people that dress good in the church, but they don't dress good at home. And then you got people that dress good at home and in the church. And, and the, the deal is, that indicates where you are in your relationship with God. Who are you dressing for? Are you dressing for me or God? You know, and that's what you have to determine. And uh, by the way, I don't, I, I don't run around and, 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 and see what people are wearing. But when I go to talking with people um, and I have to discern where they are spiritually, that is one of the key indicators, okay? How are they dressing? Um, how are they, uh, what they speak and how they do. But anyway, um, I think uh, as a child of God, as we grow in the Spirit of God, we become con or should become concerned about those things. Because uh, did we not say in one of our sermons or, or lessons here lately that uh, we are all part of the body of Christ and we are all a testimony of God? Uh, we, we are part of that testimony of the church. We are part of that testimony of, for His name's sake to the world. And so anyway, we move on now to verse 4. It says, Let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. I probably didn't spend enough time on the latter part of this verse, but let's go ahead and we'll see how it works all out. It starts off, it says, but let it be. Now go back to verse 3 for, a sec, for a sec, uh, sec, uh, just a moment. And it says, who's adorning? Let it not be. The, the, the three words, let it be, is actually one word in, in the original. The not is a negative particle put in. So what we have here, it says in three, let it not be that outward. But then when you go to four, did you notice that it's a, a let it be is in italicized? If you have a King James, you'll notice in italics. That is an understood. Now, they place that in there for English understanding. They place it sometimes in for fluidity in reading because that's the idea. But sometimes these languages don't flow like ours do and so they put it in there to help us out and so what we have in four is an understood let it be that we see in three um, now <clears throat> let me just let me let me give you an illustration for the idea here because we see it here um, if you're commanded to remove sin from your life doesn't there say, okay, you have to remove it. That's a negative connotation, right? What's the positive side? What, what is expected of you as a child of God if God is telling you to remove something from your life? Put on something else. Exactly. 
You have to replace it. Have you ever noticed um, when smokers quit smoking, they gain weight? It's, it's true. They do. Because they, they've taken something away, but then their hands. I, I should know. I used to smoke. And then, you, 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 you know, that's the way it goes. If you're going to remove something out of your mind, if you have some sin that, and thoughts that you need to remove, you need to fill that with something else. Or the old devil comes running right back and he goes back home. You don't want him to go back home. You want to move something else in. And so that's a part of it. If we're going to grow in Christ, he says here, he says, let it not be that outward adorning. Where do you get that outward? What, how do you get there? Yes, sir. By following the world standards? Yeah. You're trying to appease somebody. And, and I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to get into that a little bit more in a second. But let me, you're exactly, you, want, you went exactly where I wanted you to go. Um, a big problem in Christianity that I see with, with um, a lot of believers is they have been feasting on the wickedness of this world for so long and, and when they, they get saved, they never get out the world. They continue feasting. They continue doing the things they were doing. And I think that's a, a direct result of they don't begin to eat right. If you eat unhealthy, you will be unhealthy. you got to begin to eat healthy to get healthy. And I know I have enough people telling me that all the time. So I, I'm, I'm getting to be an expert on this. But anyway, you understand what I'm saying. If we're in the world... We've got to get out that world once we get saved, and we've got to begin to feast on the right things. One of the, the great things about reading through the Word of God continuously is you are saturating yourself. You say, well, you know, I don't really remember uh, what I read. Well, for what intent are you reading it? Are you reading it just to get it read? I've done that before. I've, I've read just to get it read and then, and then didn't move my marker and read the same five chapters again. I'm like, this seems awful familiar. You know, and then some of the times it doesn't, you know. Or are you reading it that you might know him? God, show me yourself through this passage this morning. Reveal something to me that I have not seen before. Speak to me through this. Uh, you, you'll find that your memory gets better. You'll find that that's actually more like feasting on the Word than just trying to get through it. You have to begin to feast on the Word and the things of God. You have to fill your lives with the manna of God. Get off the garlics and leeks of Egypt. You've got to get back on what's right. So he says, let it be the hidden man of the heart. First, if you're going to let it be, if you're going to be able to do what God says... To let it be the hidden man of the heart, you better have something in there. You got to be saved. How are you going to let it be the hidden man of the heart if you've never gotten saved? Well, that'd be the old man, wouldn't it? Without salvation, there's no indwelling spirit of God. Now, there's no new man hidden in your heart. And once that, you know, <clears throat> that's not it, is it? Some people seem to think salvation, I got it. I have gotten to where I need to be. Um, I, I would tell the you know, in college it was always interested. Um, uh, it actually it started back in school when people would say, you know, um, I'm going to be, I'm going to graduate, I'll be out of 12th grade and I'm done. And I'm thinking, I had enough sense to know you're not so smart then if you think you're done. And then, you know, we go to college and, and those people graduate college and they say, I'm done. You no, know, you're not. You're never done. Do you realize when you got through high school, you just qualified for the starting line. Now, it wasn't the finish line. It didn't say finish there. I don't care what you think. It didn't say finish. You, you're dyslexic or you can't read or something. You, you need to go back a little bit. And well, How would Brother Norman say? You should have learned that in first grade. Reading is, is back there. But then you finish college. You say, well, I'm done. No, you're not. You're back now on the, on the starting line to something new. It's another race. It's an, something else you're running. And you know what? Here's the interesting part. When you get through with this life and you go to heaven, you're not finished. <laughs> you're back on the starting line. That one doesn't stop. All eternity. There is no finish line there. And I think a lot of times we, we think, well, okay, this is it. I've got there. No, you need to, after salvation, begin to incorporate the things of God in your life. The basics, reading, prayer, 
um, fellowship with believers, getting in church, getting uh, saturated with the Word of God. Uh, somebody give me a definition for incorporate. What does it mean to incorporate a company? What does it mean to incorporate something in your life? To bring it under a headship? To unite, right? That's what you're saying, bring it under, to unite. What's another idea there? And, that, and that's one of them. How about to work into something that's already existent? If you're going to incorporate yourself to be more of a Christian, you've got to bring yourself into unity and into unity with what's already existing. That's God. That's His Word. So many people want to change it. Well, that doesn't work for me. Well, it's worked for everybody else to want to follow it. You've got to understand... We have uh, an obligation, once we're saved, to unite with the body of Christ, to unite with the Spirit, and move forward to a common goal. Um, and this definition actually says that we are to unite or work into something already existent so far uh, and so well that we become indistinguishable from it. Now, to me, that's a wonderful thought of Christianity. As we work ourselves into the Spirit of God, we begin to abide with Him. We stay in the Word. We become, what did I always use in, about Enoch? He walked so close with God, he was not, and God took him. We need to walk so close with God that when people see us, they don't, they don't see us, but they see God. You know? And so the, the definition here is really, uh, as far as to incorporate, to blend or combine thoroughly. Uh, it's not just salvation. It's the uniting of our body, our spirit, everything we are into Christ. That our whole being, we become Christ-like. What is Christ-likeness? Oh, this is almost like a spelling bee. I'll tell you what, boy, you take an English test. What is Christ-likeness? I have a definition, by the way. Okay, let me give you my definition. It's the embodiment of Christ here on earth which is exactly what I just got through talking about. We are the embodiment of Christ. He indwells us. And what we do, we don't do in our strength, but it needs to be in His strength. He needs to be doing it through us. Or oh, wait a minute. We need to be doing it through Him. Whew. Anyway, not me, but Him. He says here, he says, Let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible. Christ is not corruptible. Um, you know what else is, 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 is not corruptible? Godliness is not corruptible. Think about it for a minute. If you're godly, you can't be partially ungodly. You're either godly or you're not. If you're ungodly, you can't be godly. If you're godly, you can't. It's one or the other. Holy and unholy. You're either holy or you're unholy. You can't be a part of... It's one or the other. Remember what I said about gray areas. There's no gray areas. I know some people like to believe in them. The devil's got you fooled, is my opinion. That is my opinion. Okay. <clears throat> it's always, when I'm when I, uh, thinking on these things, it's, I find there are many people uh, in conversation claim to be Christian. You know, when... When you're talking with them and you're trying to witness or something, they claim to be a Christian. You know, they got their 20-year their pen. They got 26 years on the organ. They got this. They got There's always something, you know. Um, and, and they'll give you, trust me, there is a barrage. There's innumerable answers, and they're all wrong pretty much that we've heard over time. Um, it seems to me that, that the majority of people... Uh, and, and I might not be right on this, so I'll, I'll say that to start off with. Uh, claim Christianity or to be a child of God when it's convenient. So they're talking to me. Oh, yeah, I'm saved. And I say, what church should you go to? Well, what's the name of it? Um, it's the one right over there. I forget the name right now. Oh, well, who's the pastor? Well, actually, it's my mother's church. 
Okay, got it. I Clearly, I understand now. You know, it's not your church. It's not your pastor. You don't even go there half the time, but you've one time or two in your mother. But what they're doing, they're trying to, to get me to stop asking questions. They're trying to get me to go away so they can go back to the life that they were living. They're not living the Christian life. They're just trying to get out of feeling guilty. They're just trying to get out of getting caught. He says, let it be the hidden mark, man of the heart and that which is not corruptible. And then he says, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. What does that tell you? The spirit of God is, is not a boastful, loud spirit. I remember very plainly um, getting saved we end up leaving that church because they had some things they, they didn't believe. They wouldn't hold to on the Word of God. And, and God just moved us and He put us in another church. And we'd been there before I went to college, a year or so maybe. Maybe. Maybe a year. God had begun to, to work in my heart. And I remember we were, you know, it's interesting. We were back row Christians until I got saved. Now my wife drug me to church, kicking and screaming on occasions till I got saved. And I turned that around on her. Remember I told you she took up where my mother left off? Mm -hmm. Then I got to drag her kicking and screaming to the second row. <laughs> she goes, where are you going? I said, honey, we're going all the way up there. Up there? I said, you better believe it. I said, I want to get where I can. I don't want no distractions. So we went from, from probably third to the back, fourth to the back, all the way up to the front. I said, she said, you're not getting on the front row. I said, no. No, I'm not going to get on the very front row. I said, but I'm going to get on that second row right there, and I'm going to get on the end. I said, I'm going to be right on the aisle, so if I need to go up, I'm going. I want to be close in there. Um, so she, um, she got an experience there. <clears throat> you know, when I got saved, I got saved. God did a work in my heart. I mean, it wasn't anything I've done. It's what he did. Um, amen. <laughs> Never been the same. Vera, uh, <laughs> Vera come in the room. I laid across the bed reading the Bible. And this, this has been going on for a while, a couple, probably at least a couple weeks. And she looked at me, she says, what is wrong with you? <laughs> it probably wasn't even a couple weeks yet. Probably, I said, I'm reading the Bible. She says, what's wrong? I said, man, I'm reading this Bible. I just, you know, I was consumed with it. I had to read it. Well, two weeks after I got saved, she got saved. I think she understood then, you know. Uh, God was doing something. It wasn't just to claim I was a child of God. It was something had changed in me. It wasn't just convenient. It wasn't just to be uh, looked at as, 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 as a Christian or, or I was trying to impress. No. Most people um, that you talk with, I say most, I don't want to use that. Well, let me say the most people that, that claim to be Christian but don't act like it, uh, they'll say it to your face, but the moment you turn around, they reject it. Go back to what they're doing. Um, it may be popular Sunday morning, but Saturday and Friday night, it's not popular to be a Christian, so they're back with the ground. They don't want you around. So it's uh, going back to that, that meek and quiet spirit. Uh, God begins to do something. I, and I remember when I was sitting on that second row that... Uh, um, God began to work in my heart, and, and the pastor asked me, he says, you going to college? And I said, Pastor, I don't know. He said, what's God want you to do? I said, I can't hear him. Everybody's telling me what to do. I said, everybody's just telling me I need to do this and I need to do that. He says, well, you don't know? I said, I got no idea what God wants me to do. And I told you before, everybody got quiet after that. Pastor shut him up. God began to speak to my heart. I remember writing notes down on visitor it wasn't visitor cards you had to fill out a card when you went there to say you was present because the church was a very big church and I remember writing on the back of the notes and I said when God speaks to you it's always in a still small voice because he doesn't out shout anybody God waits for you to listen you got to get everybody else out. You got to get all that noise out, and you got to get alone. And I thought of Elijah by that creek. He wasn't in the fire. He wasn't in the whirlwind. He wasn't in the earthquake, but he was in the still small voice. You get your heart in tune with God, and you'll hear that voice. He's not go out shout 
anybody else. But he's going to wait on you to get right. Yeah, exactly. They don't want the stillness because, for whatever reason, I don't want to say because I have my own opinions about that. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, acid rock blaring everywhere you went. Even when you went home, you couldn't hardly get away from it because all your neighbors were doing it. So it was really oppressive. You come back to the States and it's like, it was unbelievable. So, yeah. <clears throat> Peter states in that which is not corruptible. And I mentioned God in this. So let's see where I'm at. You know, I've kind of covered everything that's there. Let me just say that whatever you've hidden your heart, whether it be the old man or new man, whatever it is that you've hidden your heart, uh, you can't hide forever. It's eventually going to come out. It's going to be revealed. Uh, we need to be sure that what we're hiding there is that which is not corruptible. We need to be sure that what we're hiding there is a meek and lowly, quiet spirit. Because God says, that's of great price. That's what he desires. And I think the reason is because God can speak to us then. You get alone, and I, I love my devotions first thing in the morning. I love it when nobody's up. Nobody's going to work yet, and I can go in there and sit down, and there's nothing happening. And I can open my Bible, and I don't hear anything. But if you wait till about 7, then you hear the cars cranking and the people going. But early in the morning, you don't hear anything. And I think that's, that's very valuable um, that you spend that quiet of the day with God. Now go on to verse 5. And he says, For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection to their own husband. And after this manner, what's he talking about? Verse 4. Yeah. And, and the one previous was, was talking about not let it be adorning with the outward. Those ladies of old time, they didn't, it wasn't an outward adorning so much, it was the inward adorning. And that's what he's talking about. You know, the, the people um, in our day and age, they're always looking on the outside. And that's what, there's nothing wrong with that per se, because that's what initially attracts us. That's what initially attracted my wife. Now, for the life of me, I can't figure out why it went the other way. But anyway, I know what attracted me that way. And so, but after that, what holes? Well, it's got to be that inner beauty. Because outward beauty passes. It's the inner beauty. And that's what we're talking about here. You know, I, I, I don't know if I've ever said this, but I've met a, a number of beautiful women in my life, uh, you know, as you're, you're going. And, and, and some of those women, it's like, what is wrong with you? I mean, you're, you're just nasty, mean-spirited. And the outward look did not match what was... It was in the heart. I mean, just ugly, ugly. Just a vile, hard nature. And you have to wonder, you know, what's going on here? Um, I don't know that I said that before. Well, I'm not going to say that. Never mind. <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm going to read what I, I wrote here. Um, um, you know, we have a word now for, for nasty uh, ladies. Argumentative. Do you all know what it is? Karen's. You know, I heard that. Yeah, yeah, we heard that. And this come to my mind when I was thinking about those nasty dispositions. Karen's do not care for anyone and no one truly cares for Karen because of them not caring enough to care to be caring of others and the way they treat them. Now that sums them up right there. Karen's do not care for anyone. And no one truly cares for Karen because of them not caring enough to be caring of others. You know, it, it, those are people, and, and it's not entirely true because we do want them to be saved, but those are people that you really don't want to be around because of that negative nature, the way they are. You just, you want to separate. Um, and so Peter states, uh, after this manner in old time, the holy women, uh, in the times of the patriarchs, these ladies who had been uh, most commended of God were ladies who sought to be godly, holy, and in subjection to the husband. Oh no, there's that word again. Subjection, submitting to their husbands. Um, why does he bring this up like this? 
after this, now, now look what he says. After this manner, the manner that we've said in the old days. How many of you remember always say, you know, I remember the old days. Oh yeah, the, old, the good old days. That's what we usually say. And it says, um, uh, then he says the holy women. Not just ladies, not just women. He qualifies them, holy women. And then he says, who trusted in God? He's telling you the traits of godliness or, or, or meekness. He's telling you a quiet spirit. How can you have a meek and quiet spirit in this day? How can you have a meek and quiet spirit with the way people act today? Tell me, how can you do it? The answer is right here, by the way. By abiding in the Lord. Yeah. And abiding is trusting in God. Uh, I was talking to my wife when we got in the car. I said, you know, the fact is we never have to react to what other people say and do. We don't have to react. If the moment you react, you allow them to control you. Wait a minute. Who's supposed to control us? <laughs> their actions should. Their words should. Their temperament should. The Holy Spirit should. And yet so often we let the things of this world control us. Um, I have to... How many of you know I got a temper? How many of you know it? Because I've told you that. Yeah, my wife, okay. You can't answer this next question. How many of you actually seen me display that? Oh, yeah, I got one. But I don't display it. Because I don't let them people get under me. Now, every now and then, Bruce has seen me come close. And we've had some people that um, went against the Word of God. And, and, and uh, to be honest with you, I was very irritated with them because I seen the people they were leading in the wrong direction and, and, and they claimed to be so godly and yet their understanding of scripture was non-existent. And I got irritated. I really did. And I think that's righteous indignation. Um, huh? No, but I made some people look. You know, I was, I was, I was, I was, it may have turned over some tables in the heart, but you know, uh, it, it, I hate doing things like that. And, and anyway, I, I do have a temper. <clears throat> I do. Uh, but I try to keep it controlled. And how do I do that? How do you control your temper when, when things draw you haywire? How do you do that? I got a, I got a better one than either one of those right now. The first measure is flee. Run. Get away from it. So let's say it's my wife. Can't run too far. And I can say, okay, I don't want to hear any more of this. We're done. It's not helping me spiritually. Okay? Uh, I, I, I remove myself out of it. Uh, this is not... Why? Because the, the, if you get, let yourself get in, in... Who takes control? The emotions. Anger. Oh, yeah, I could do that. I could get worked up. I don't need that. I need to continue in the Spirit of God, and so do each and every one of us. And we have to learn. There are certain things that's going to trigger you. There are certain things that are going to get on your skin. And we have to learn how to remove ourselves out of that situation. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you can't physically remove. So you have to move here. That's when you pray. That's when you start asking God, begging God, help me control this. Um, we all have trigger points. We all have things that we have to do. But you have to learn. Uh, there are things that, that, that will trigger us. There were things that will drive us nuts. But after this manner, we have to let that hidden man be in control. We have to, to learn to walk as God would have us walk and allow that meek and quiet spirit to be the one that, that, that rules in our lives. And he says, adorning themselves who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. What does that mean? Who trusted in God. Then it says, adorned themselves, being in subjection to their own husbands. It's a very interesting wording there. What does that mean? How do you adorn yourself 
by being in subjection. You put on makeup, don't you? You put on jewelry? Huh? Am I not correct on that? Do you not put on the Spirit of God? Do you not adorn yourself with that Spirit? You trust in God. Say, Lord, I'm going to, I'm going to just surrender this to you. And adorn yourself in the Spirit of God. Learn to subject to the things of God. Do you think anything has happened in your life by accident? Has anything ever happened in your life by accident? Well, we don't want to answer that, do we? Because if we say yes, it gives us a little leadway. Well, I can react the way I want. No, it's never happened by accident. God has, has a plan. He has a, a will for your life. And he allows these things to come into our lives to mature us, to make us better, to teach us I think a lot of things that's happened in my life have taught me my shortcomings. I'm not where I, I'm not as spiritual as I thought I was. You know, sometimes it teaches other people I'm not where I ought to be too. You know, then at times it teaches me. Well, you know, you, this is an area that you're doing good in. You need to continue. Or this is an area you're really not doing so good in. You you need to work harder in that. Or this is an area you need to run from. You know. Have you ever prayed and said, Lord, um, allow this to happen in my life so that I don't, you know, I don't get, you know. I prayed, and you know, I've said this many times, uh, several things I prayed for in my life that God would do. I wanted um, a lot of things, but I prayed for years never to be a reproach upon the name of God. I always asked him to remove me off of this world before they ever happened. Now, when you, that's kind of a blanket prayer in a way. God, I don't want to be a reproach upon your name. So you've just given him an open ticket to do whatever he needs to do to keep you from doing that. Think about it. He can take your sight. He can bedrid you, uh, take your health. He can do anything he wants. If, if you was going to do something, he knows. So he, you give him... It, there's no better person to give a blank check to, by the way. There is, you know, if you're serious. <laughs> you know, God, I don't want to be a reproach to you. I don't want to be the one that, that somebody looks at and says, well, he did it, and then they never accept Christ or they never live for God and cause other people to die and go to hell. I don't want to be that person. I would rather God take me. I, uh, you know, I, and I've said this before, I always prayed that if, if we were going to have children, my children would grow up and serve the Lord. If they weren't going to, don't give me any. I don't want any. Well, God never gives us any, so I don't have to worry about it. Okay? My, I don't have to worry about children going wayward because as I prayed, God answered that prayer. Um, Most people, if they thought that that was a valid prayer, would pray that. Yeah. Like it's not that seems so bizarre to me. To, to pray that? Like, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> well, you know, my I'm, I'm going to qualify that. I'm going to tell you, my mother said I was different. I walked to the beat of a different drummer. And I didn't figure that out for years, but I finally did. My wife says I'm a peculiar person. Well, when your mother and your wife tell you that, you just accept it. I am. I think different. My wife said, I always told my wife, I see things other people don't see. I was always highly observant. She said, there's a pill for that. I said, I don't know. I, I was different. But you know, as I look back on my life, um, because I was different, uh, people were abusive to me. They ridiculed me and rode me and all that. But you know, that, that thickened my skin. <laughs> people say something now. I said, I don't give a hoot what you think. I'm going to walk with God the best I can and the best of my ability, what I think the scripture teaches me. I don't care whether you like it or not. You know, some people say, well, what did he think? You know, I'm just, what does he think? That's all I care about. And so with that and understanding, I think my life in all these things prepared me for the ministry God has given me. For, and I think, to be honest with you, I think each and every one of you, has specific circumstances in your life that God has prepared you for the ministry 
that he's got you for. I don't think it's by accident. Can we make wrong decisions? Sure, sure. Can we limit ourselves in the ministries God would have had? Sure we could. All that's possible. But God can still use us if we're willing. And that's, that's really the point, isn't it? How willing are we to adorn ourselves with that meek and quiet spirit and allow God to use us? That's, that's the whole point. Um, I will get into this a little bit and then I'll, I'll stop. Well, maybe I should stop because this is, is, is getting ready to get into something that may be contentious. So anyway, we're stopping. <laughs> I'll tell you what I, was, I had here. I had a little bit wrote on makeup. Um, and, and, and I'll just go ahead and say a few words on it just so you know where I was headed. Um, I always look at, at people and, and observe uh, when we're out and about. Uh, evangelists, church evangelists have always been bad about their wives seem like they're, they're, they were worse about this. They always put on a ton of makeup and doll themselves up. And when I see that, I see a discontent. That's my take on it. That's my opinion. It's a discontent with how God has made the person. And, and I, I look at that, and, and why are you making yourself up on the outside? And this scripture kind of lent to that. Who's adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of the plaiting of the hair, of the wearing of gold, of putting on apparel. Nothing is wrong with that. Oh, um, J. Vernon McGee. Had a lady come to him at the end of a service and um, he had preached a, a little bit on makeup and she took it that he was talking against makeup. And he said, after he got a chance to speak, he said, lady, I, I'm, I apologize if you took it that way. He said, that's not my intention. He said, that's not what I said. He said, I think, um, and maybe it was the other way. Maybe she wasn't wearing makeup and, and he preached that you should wear a little bit. He said, I think... Um, uh, the old barn needs a little coat of paint every now and then. <clears throat> well, anyway, that didn't sit well with her. So anyway, you can imagine, if you've ever heard J. Vernon McGee, he's a, he's a character. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to say that. But So I'm not really speaking against it, but I'm telling you, that's not the focus. He said, let it be the hidden man of the heart. That in that which is not corruptible, that which is of God, that which we should put on is the ornament it should be the ornamentation of or our ornament what we adorn ourselves with should be the meek and quiet spirit which to God is of great price and so anyway um, I've done went over we're on your dime so let's go ahead and um, go into our prayer uh, time